I just panicked because I didn't see a computer on here and uh, I thought that Anna was uh, about to present just with her hands. No, this will not happen. So please, uh, now we, we move on and uh, we welcome Anna Travazet. Um, Anna, she, she obtained her degree in biology in the University of Barcelona. Uh, but then her PhD in biological science at the University of Pennsylvania. She runs her own uh, lab at the IMEDEA um, Institute, Institute Mediterranean Studies Avançats, Mediterranean Institute of Advanced Studies. And um, so she, she basically works on in three research lines in ecology. Uh, one of them is the ecology and evolution of species interactions. Um, a second one has to do with the uh, functional role in the community and on the fitness consequences of the interactive, uh, interacting species with a special focus on pollination and seed dispersal, so mutualistic communities. And then the third one, which is the one that tells me that I got the wrong job, it's, it's Iceland Ecology. So she has had the chance to do field work, of course, in the Balearics, in Canary Islands, Galapagos, Seychelles, and, uh, you know, you name it. Uh, again, uh, uh, I'd like to finish similar to how I started with Phil. The thing that I like in Anna's profile, uh, as I mentioned for Phil, for social science, cognitive science, in this case has to do with interdisciplinary effort, which is so hard to do. So in this case, she's coming from uh, um, biological sciences, but how she collaborates with physicists in, in, uh, um, in, in let's say, hybrid uh, projects and also combining theory and field work. So uh, I'm just looking forward for this talk. Uh, let's welcome Anna. Thank you. But I need a computer. No duplication in the Ah, vale, vale. Ah, okay. Vale. Vale, vale. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay, well, good afternoon. Thank you for attending. And well, first of all, I want to say that uh, I'm very thankful to uh, Jose Javier uh, Damasco and uh, Maxi San Miguel for inviting me to attend this uh, conference. Conference is the first time I attend, but it will certainly not be the, the last one. I love this uh, discipline. And I have already learned a lot this morning, and I'm sure I will be learning a lot this during this week. And I also hope you will learn something from, from my talk. I also want to say that it's uh, great to be in this uh, scenario. I usually, well, I often come to this auditorium to for concerts, and I had never imagined that one day I would be uh, up here. So from now on, I will see it differently. <laughs> Okay, uh, well, this doesn't work, next, okay, yeah. I will start by introducing uh, you, my collaborators in this work. We are a group of, we are a group of island uh, ecologists interested in unveiling how uh, the biodiversity of islands, not just the species, but uh, also the, their interactions. And we aim at understanding how island uh, systems work. And we, uh, we feel very fortunate to have joined this group of physicists uh, below, uh, Victor Aguilus, Lucas Lacasa, and uh, Mar Cuevas, who are all three here, and will receive all the questions that I cannot answer at the end, if they are difficult. And yeah, it's great to have these meetings with them and writing papers and analyzing data. We always learn uh, many things from them and they, I think they also learn things from us. For instance, that there is not just one species of bee in the world. And now we are not uh, longer scared when we see these long equations. So it's a good mutualism. Okay. Understanding how a, a, an ecosystem works implies understanding the complexity of ecological interactions in, in it. And this is actually one of the main uh, challenges in the natural sciences. Uh, however, for their simplified biota and their well-defined borders, islands constitute ideal systems to, to study complexity. And the recent development of a 
this multi-layer network approach provides a, from, a promising framework to analyze multiple layers of complexity, each layer being a different ecological function. So in this case, in this figure, we see that, like the pollination function, function, so a network where you have the pollinators about and the flowers. Uh, another layer of complexity is the seed dispersal function with the dispersers and the fruit below. And another is the interactions between symbio symbiotic uh, fungi and also the plants. Uh, such framework, this multi-layer and network framework, uh, can be useful to unveil which are the keystone species in an ecosystem and how they uh, shape ecosystem structure, function, and, and resilience. Uh, for this, though, we need to study many different types of interactions simultaneously. And this is logistically diff difficult, as you can imagine, and that's why most studies focus just on a single type of interaction. For example, you can see many papers on networks just on pollination or just on parasites or just on seed dispersal. So it's challenging to study all this uh, simultaneously. Uh, on the other hand, detecting and quantifying the, the links across uh, these layers, quantifying the links, yeah, because we are talking about weighted multi-layer networks. Okay? So quantifying these links is also inherently difficult, as you will see. And once the multi-layer network uh, is built, the next challenge is to accurately predict how a disturbance can uh, affect the multi-layer network. So we need to uh, develop new dynamic extinction models uh, that include these link strengths and that consider also rewiring of interactions, so dynamic uh, models. One of the goals of most community ecologists is to detect keystone species in a system. There are, however, different definitions of keystone species, so one needs to make it clear what, uh, to what refers when using this term. Some authors refer to keystone uh, species uh, to those influencing uh, a community or ecosystem function disproportionately to their abundance. Uh, for, for others, most I would say, uh, keystone species are those with a high degree or are the, just the most abundant species in the community. And still other, uh, others, including myself and people that work on networks, uh, call the, uh, keystone species to those species determining network structure and whose elimination can lead to uh, dramatic changes in the community, to its fragmentation and even to its collapse. Uh, such keystone species often underpin multiple functions and identifying them from a multidisciplinary and uh, multifunctionality uh, perspective is especially relevant when predicting uh, community or ecosystem uh, stability and resilience to, to different types of disturbance. An example that clearly illustrates how important a species can be in an ecosystem and that I want to, I like to show in my talks, is that published uh, four years ago by the team of Graham and collaborators yeah, from a study performed in the Ch uh, Chagos Archipelago in the Central Indian Ocean. They show that when abundant, seabirds feeding in the open ocean transport large quantities of nutrients onto islands enhancing the pro productivity of island fauna and flora. Uh, the leaching of these nutrients back into the sea influences the productivity, structure, and functioning of adjacent coral reef ecosystems. Some islands are infested by rats, uh, while others are free of rats. Rats prey upon the seabirds. So in the islands where there are uh, rats, the uh, seabirds mm, uh, are extinct. So this constitutes a a nice natural experiment to test, change, to test changes in community structure and functioning. The results show that seabirds act as ecos what we call ecosystem engineers, and that rat introduction disrupt nutrient flows among pelagic island and coral island and coral reef ecosystems. Hence, seabirds are clearly keystone species in this system. 
of detecting uh, keystone species has mostly been restricted, as I said, to studies that examine only one or a few types of interactions. Uh, however, as you can imagine, also species are embedded in, in multiple interactions and play multiple ecological roles. So it's time to move uh, from considering unifunctionality to multifunctionality. Uh, quantifying species multifunctionality is uh, challenging, as I said. Building these quantitative multilayer networks requires a standardized, measure, standardized measurement of a species' importance in each function. That is using the same currency to estimate the weights of intra and interlayer edges or links, each layer uh, corresponding to a different ecological process. So far, only one study has ecological study has empirically estimated the weight of edges between layers uh, by quantifying the role of the same individual in two ecological process, processes. So in this case, we had uh, birds that are the dots that are shared between layers participating in these uh, two functions, pollination and seed dispersal. Uh, the nodes are different species of birds and the edge weight we consider is the proportion of individuals of each species that are found in both layers. That is, those that transport both pollen and seeds simultaneously. And obviously, as, we, as the number of ecological functions examined increases, the standardiz standardization also becomes more challenging. In an ongoing study, the results of which I'm going to presenting to you in a moment, uh, we are dealing with five complexity layers corresponding to five different ecological functions. Our shared species across our five layers are plants, and we studied their interactions. Two below ground, so the interactions with two different types of uh, fungi, the saprophytic ones and the mycorrhizas. One are um, the composers and the others are mutualistic uh, fungi. And above ground, we study three different types of interactions, the pollination, the herbivory, and the seed dispersal. All these are a key ecological functions in most terrestrial ecosystems, but of course they are not the only ones, but we just focus for the moment on these five. Studying such a high number of interaction times simultaneously indeed represents a major advance in ecological networks to, compared to what has been considered to date, which, is, which are snapshots of independent interaction types. So the main uh, objectives of our study were to assess species contribution to, to multiple functions. So we want to uh, use this new approach uh, based on the probability of a species uh, to participate in a particular ecological function and also in connecting uh, the different functions. Uh, secondly, we want to evaluate whether the number of participant species uh, is evenly distributed across functions. And third, we want to determine if this species multifunctionality is uh, driven uh, or correlated by natural factors like abundance or plant vegetation cover. These are the two traits that we have measured so far. Uh, I'm going to present you... Uh, the, the data from the Balearic Island, that's Narredona, but uh, that's south of Mallorca, within the Cabrera um, National Park, Cabrera Archipelago. But this study is framed within a much larger study that has recently been funded by an ERC grant, which will start in a couple of weeks from now. And it's aimed at studying the complexity of islands from different archipelagos located at different uh, latitudes. So uh, today we'll pre I'll present, to present you some preliminary uh, data, very fresh because we have been analyzing it in the last uh, months and weeks uh, from this island. Navardona is a small island of approximately 11 hectares of and 55 uh, meters height. Its primary habitat is Mediterranean sh uh, shrubland. Accessing this island is not easy. Well, I forgot to say, all these islands or islets, because they are small islands, 
less than three square kilometers all of them. They are pristine, rather pristine, so not humans inhabiting the island, not even in the past. And while well, accessing them is not uh, easy, so that's another limitation we have. But since most of them are in uh, national parks, we have the help by the park guards to, to enter the, the islands. We are always a, a group of five to six people, which is also the maximum allowed because usually there are seabirds nesting, so there's limitations. And we all need uh, to be well coordinated, coordinated to capture as many interactions as, as possible in a um, limited amount of time. So I brought you some slides that we'll pass quickly for just to for you to have an idea of how we collect this data. I think it's, it's you are not used to this uh, information, so I will since, since this is interdisciplinarity, right? So uh, how do we gather the plant fungal interactions? We collect the roots of different individuals of each plant species along established uh, transects. Sub subsequently, we send this material uh, to a lab where they do the molecular analysis and study the fungi and they classify them in functional groups. So far, we have this saprophytic and mycorrhizal fungi, but we also aim at including the parasitic fungi very shortly. To sample plant pollinator interactions, we conduct censuses at different times of the day, consisting of uh, different, uh, uh, consisting of direct observations on the plants. And additionally, we, cap we capture lizards and, and birds and gather samples from their feathers, from their skin, around the mouth parts. And subsequently, assess the pollen, assess the pollen they transport by using a, a light microscope. Each individual plant census, as well as each capture, capture individual uh, animal, is considered a sampling unit. The plant herbivore interactions are evaluated in different individuals on each plant species, browsing also the branches and recording all arthropods found feeding on the plant tissues. And most species are identified by an entomologist to species levels. So we want to have well resolved networks as much as possible. And when, when that is not possible, at least uh, the entomologist says this is different, so that we call it morpho species. So we can include it in the network as a, a different node. And finally, to sample the plant seed dispersal interactions, we put mist nets to capture birds, then we, cap we get the, dro the droppings. Also, we search for pellets of gulls and all other seabirds, uh, lizards, and also we look for ant nests to see which species, which plants the ants are dispersing. And we also later identify the seeds under a stereo microscope with seed reference collections. Okay, all the data we'll, I'll present, we're collecting during two field campaigns. We uh, go in the most contrasting season, so in the rainy season and in the dry season to collect as many interactions as possible. But of course, we cannot do the complete network. These are, these are just as many interactions as we can from the two most contrasting seasons. Uh, okay, and then with, just to show you how we measure very easily the abundance and the vegetation cover, we also establish transects and we uh, estimate uh, abundance by counting the number of individuals of each species in the different transects and the island, um, the, 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 pre, let's see, the, the cover, vegetation cover is also obtained by measuring the, the length that each species occupies along the transect. Okay, how do we measure this? Uh, the edges in, in our study. Regarding the intralayer edges, we estimated them as the probability of a particular plant species I interacting with animal fung fungus species J. So that is the number of individual plants on which uh, animal fungus J was found out of all plants uh, of the species I that we have sampled. This is usually the, the, the link weight or the edge weight that we use in the uh, bipartite networks. On the other hand, the interlayer edges uh, are, were estimated as the probability that the plant species participated in a pair of layers, so alpha and beta. 
the probability that a plan I participates in function alpha is the product of all probabilities of plant I interacting with all animals and fungus species. The estimation of this interlayer H is valid, of course, under the assumption that the probabilities of participation in different, in different functions for a given plan are independent. This is, of course, just an assumption, a hypothesis, but until now we don't have uh, this information, so we propose this estimate as a first step to quantify uh, these uh, edges. These in order to assess how a species contributes to multiple functions, we use this multi-layer network approach that differs from what has been used previously. In such a multi-layer network, each layer corresponds now to a plant species rather than to an ecological function. Node size is proportional to the probability of a species participating in a particular function, whereas edge width is proportional to the probability of participating in two functions. So in this example, this edge width would be the product of one half and one type, and one half, one fourth. We can represent each plant species as a pentagon, where the vertices or nodes uh, correspond to each of the five ecological functions, right? So this is dispersal, age herbivory, pea pollination, saprophytic fungi, and symbiont fungi. And their size is given by the probability that the plant species participates in that function. While edge, while edge ways are estimated as the probability that the species I participates in the two. So, for instance, for this plant, Medica corporea, the larger size of the herbivory function indicates that the plant has a higher probability of participating in this function than in the others. And the wider edge between H and SPF uh, tells us that this plant is also more likely to link these functions than the other functions. Studying multifunctionality in a community can be done focusing on the species or in the ecological functions in which they participate. That is, in detecting keystone species or keystone, keystone ecological interactions. Our plan is studying both perspectives, but in this talk I'm focusing just on the former, so on the identification of keystone species. Thus, we first wanted to rank the participation of each species in functions and in connecting functions. And for this, we calculated the contribution of plant species I in a given function relative to that of all plant species, and then obtained the average relative participation of plant I in the total set of functions. Similarly, we estimated the relative contribution of plant species I involved in a pair of functions. And then we calculated again the average relative participation of plant species I in pairs of function by averaging over all possible pairs. So this average I later used to rank the species according to their importance participating in functions and in connecting pairs of functions. This one. <laughs> Farber quantified the importance that, apply, that a plant I has in connecting ecological functions through a particular function compared to the corresponding total contributions of the total number of plants in the community and plants. So for this purpose, we calculated the node participation index, which ranges from zero to one, and that is a following Batiston and collaborators a paper published in 2014. This index is defined as the strength of a function in, a, in layer I divided by the total strength of the function across all plants or all layers. So what this index tells us is how much of the total weight of connecting uh, through each function each plant has. So a high value for plant I in pollination, for example, means that this plant connects much with the other functions through the pollination function. I hope you are following me. To assess how uh, the connections between functions are distributed among plants, we then use the probability that plant I participates in each, in each pair of functions, which can be interpreted as the edge participation index. Once we know 
how plants participate in the different functions and in connecting functions, we now want to determine which are those species that participate in most functions and thus can, can be considered as keystone species. Uh, we thus use the log likelihood rank to quantify the plant species multifunctionality. We rank the species by penalizing them each time they do not participate in a function. And we use the logarithm because of the low number of the probabilities. We then tested the correlation using the sperm and coefficient between this likelihood, likelihood rank and the ranks of plant abundance and vegetation cover. Okay, the results. Uh, this is the full bipartite multilayer networks, which are how it looks like, in which node represents plant species and animal uh, fungus species, and it just represents the connections between plants and each animal fungus or, or fungus. Edge widths quantify the weight of interaction, while edges color denote the functional interaction type. For plant species, node sizes are proportional to the plant abundance in the sample. And the number of plant species, as you can see, is uh, well, it's 19, they are listed here. And those participating in all complexity layers are those indicated in, in blue. This is another representation of the network to examine the mesoscale organization. It's obtained by means of InfoMap, which is a clustering algorithm based on the map equation. We found that the main communities that conform the network mostly match plant species that contain generalist species, plant species, that is plants that participate in various functions. The exceptions for the most part correspond to specialist plants. So plants that participate only in one or two functions. So community two, for instance, that's the violet uh, color, encompasses the most generalist plants that participate in a high number of functions. And by contrast, uh, three or six is yellow, uh, orange, and, and green, include specialist uh, plants that participate in, in one or two functions. Okay, this is the, the rank uh, of plant species according to their importance participating in functions the node rank in blue, and in connecting pairs of functions, the gray, uh, the gray color. Remember that the node participation rank is obtained as the average probability of participation of plant species I in a layer alpha relative to all M plants in the community. Similarly, the edges, are for, for edges, the plant species are ranked according to their importance in connecting pairs of ecological functions. So we see a total uh, of five species, the first five species, uh, that show the highest relative contribution in function participation. And specifically two of them, this Wittania frutescens and Olea europea, which is the olive uh, tree, by the way, stand out for their contribution both in participating and in connecting ecological functions. For our analysis, we have used the aggregated multilayer networks that looks like this at the function level. So pulling all animals and fungi for each uh, function. So this is how the 19 pentanons look like. And overall, um, we found that node and age participation indexes rank from zero to 0 0.6 for all plant species. And we also see that uh, most plant species contributed to only three, two or three ecological functions with, with index values lower than 0 0.2. However, four of these plants uh, that are in red contributed to the conne connection uh, through all the five functions. The ecological role of one, this Wittania frutescens, the below, was found to be disproportionately important with a contribution of 0.56 uh, through the dispersal function, followed by Lavatera Maritima and, and Olea Europea. In this matrix, we can visual, 
we can visualize the participation of each species in the different ecological functions. So we can see that the number of participating species is not evenly distributed across functions. So a, high no a higher number of species participate in the first function, so they have saprophytic uh, fungi, and in the herbivory function too. And well, these new perspectives allow us to uh, identify the generalist and the specialist species. So for instance, Uitania is the most generalist species, while others like Limonium, well, the two uh, last columns, just uh, participate in, in one function. Finally, this is the likelihood rank for all plant species, where different colors account for the number of zeros encountered in the array of, of the probabilities that the corresponding plant species participates in each ecological function. Thus, the most functional species are those in green color, so the first five uh, columns, uh, participating in more functions and more strongly in each function and coincide with the species for which we find the highest node and age participation indexes uh, before. The correlation between, between this likelihood, likelihood rank and the abundance and vegetation cover rank was intermediate for both cases was only 0.45 and was only marginally significant. So, uh, well, we see that most the most uh, multifunctional species are not necessarily the most abundant or those covering a larger area. Hence, that means that there are other factors uh, that may be driving this species multifunctionality uh, that will need to be investigated in the future in future studies. Right? It could be phenology, morphology, who knows. So the take home message uh, would be messages would be this islands that actually are small continents, because all this is applicable to larger islands and also to continents, are suitable ecosystems to understand the ecological uh, complexity. And this multi-layer uh, network approach we have used quantifying the species multifunctionality also appears to be quite useful to, to detect the keystone species and the keystone ecological functions in, in a community. So I think I will finish with that and I will thank you. I thank you very much for your attention and I will be happy to take questions. And again, the difficult ones will go directly to Mar or to Victor. I hope he's around and Lucas and I also hope he's around. Thank you. Okay, so as Anna said, she's ready to take questions and then deliver them to the right uh, spot. So we also love to hear suggestions because, as I said, we are still analyzing all the data. Hi. Um, I would just so you, you showed this matrix of species and their functions, but there were some species that didn't seem to do anything ecologically speaking. So, I mean, I understand why you focus on the keystone species, but basically there were two or three very black rows towards the right of your matrix. Mm -hmm. And somehow the question is, how is there a species that no other species relies on or so on? And what's basically what's up with a species that don't seem to do anything in an ecosystem? Well, first I must remind you that we are just going there for two weeks, we see all the interactions we can see in those uh, periods. Uh, well, we believe that we gather most of the interactions occurring at that time. And for instance, if uh, this one of the ones that was only participating in one function like Limonium didn't have any of the any pollinators, it means that they do have very few pollinators, although they have the flowers because we census all plants in flower when we go there, all, fla all plants that are in flower at that time. So that doesn't mean that in the pollination layer is out, but uh, 
but it just it is very unlikely to participate in that layer. So we, we don't. But maybe we have found uh, a herbivore in that uh, in the leaves of that uh, plant. So all the plants are connected in each of the layer. Otherwise, they would not appear in any of the networks. So they have at least one function. It's hard to see on the black uh, black and yellow matrix, but okay, fair enough. No, because in the two columns or three, the last ones, they were mostly uh, blue, but they had uh, lighter blue connected to one function. In one okay. case was dispersal and in one case, so it was not totally okay. zero. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fair I'm enough. Sure. Hi, uh, thanks a lot for your talk. It's really interesting. Uh, I was wondering, uh, well, one of the uh, for one of the um, islands that you mentioned that you're going to go to is uh, in Svalbard. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering for mm -hmm. the more uh, either super north or super southern islands, uh, temporality might become and seasonality might become a more uh, mm -hmm. like a bigger problem. Yeah. <laughs> so in those cases, I do you plan to go multiple times to like in a year to try exactly. and sample more, say, migratory birds and, and that kind of thing? Yes, yes, of course. We'll go to Svalbard at 78 degrees. That's going to be a challenge for me because I've been always in the tropics and in the subtropics. But, but uh, yeah, we'll sample in the summer. In the summer, of course, the rest of the year is covered by snow. So very few interactions. So we'll go. Mm, during more time and we'll repeat the sampling more one more year so then Two will years. your multi-layer networks also be temporarily changing or will it still be aggregated aggregated within the year no we plan to consider them uh, separately yeah and of course well this ERC is also to look at the effect of global change on, on these pristine islands comparing them with uh, islands of this or areas of the same size in a nearby inhabited island where there are multiple invasive species that have uh, that well surely we'll find that uh, the, the network is very different all the inhabited islands have rats have uh, goats rabbits invasive plants so we, yeah our hypothesis is that we'll have different um uh, networks structure and and we are going to have enough uh, large networks to compare one hand like the spring or the rain in the tropics rainy season with the dry season Great. so you. yeah we'll have uh, we hope that what i said to the evaluators of the erc we plan to get a great data set we also can, we'll be able to test many different biogeographical hypotheses using the same systematic protocol. And all this data will be released. So any of you that want to work on that data in five years from now, will be able to do it. <laughs> so we take just one last question. I think we all need the coffee. Right yes, ma'am. Yeah, thank you for, for your nice speech. Is, isn't the, <clears throat> aren't the function of uh, every species related to their ecosystems? That means if you change the ecosystems, that, that information is no more expo exploitable. The information about their function in, uh, across the layers. Uh, no, because in, in any, well, there are ecosystems, terrestrial ecosystems, like deserts where like, pollinators are very, very scarce, and perhaps that there is one plant that is shared with another, but this is rare, with another ecosystem, and in that place, the plant or, or a rela phylogenetically related plant does have pollinator. But the, the functions we are planning to, to planning to study, they are all in all ecosystems. We are planning also to work on prey predator interactions. That's everywhere. These uh, parasites, scavengers. So we have selected these uh, interactions that like form the backbone of biodiversity. But for instance, we are not studying like the microbiome of 
of the animals, of the insects. We may, it's not incorporated in the proposal, but I recently met a guy that is interested in studying the bi microbiome of birds. So taking advantage of that we gather these, we capture these birds and these lizards, we can get samples from whatever and send them to labs that want to do other things with them. Because yeah, each sample we get from these islands is quite expensive, actually. In Galapagos, for instance, each day of both is like fifteen hundred uh, dollars. So yeah, each inter I once I calculated the price of each interaction, it was <laughs> around fifty dollars each. Okay. 